one of the many things I learned from 2022 is that I can only make reaction videos on movie trailers, but not on the movies themselves. The fact that I had to make this video after my movie reaction video on Batman and Superman Battle of the Super Sons ended up getting blocked a month after being approved is all the evidence I need to prove that fact. And because of that, I now need to make this very late to the party review on that film. With it coming to HBO Max being another excuse to do this. The movie was released first on October 7th in New York Comic Con, and for the rest of the world on October 18th, in both cases last year in 2022. It was directed by Matt Peters and written by Jeremy Adams, while starring Jack Dylan Grazer and Jack Griffo as the titular characters. But for some reason it is their dads who are given the top billing. The concept of the Super Sons as the sons of Superman and Batman was first conceived in the 154th issue of the world's finest comic in 1965 by Bob Haney and Dick Dillon. Unimaginatively, they were named as Clark Kent Jr. and Bruce Wayne Jr., whose mothers were never referred by name, nor were their faces shown, with the only clues to their identities were that Superman's wife was dark-haired and Batman's wife was a redhead. So, more than likely they were Lois Lane and probably Vicky Vale, because she was a redhead in the comics before the 1989 Batman movie with Kim Basinger in the role came out. But those versions were merely an early concept that was thrown out the window after it was introduced and was only barely visited again over the years, until Peter Tomasi revitalized the concept in this exact in 2017, starring Damian Wayne's Robin and the then recently created Jonathan Samuels Kent version of Superboy. For more explanations on that series and the titular characters, I recommend you to watch these two videos I had made prior to this movie coming out, or in Damian's case, just half of this one. Or maybe just this one because it's shorter and more focused on John's characterization, on whom this movie is also more focused on. Regardless, I I'm going to go forward with the notion that you have seen the movie, this video I made prior to the film's release, and at the very least the first half of this video. Despite the fact that this movie is named Batman and Superman Battle of the Super Sons, the movie instead opens with a retelling of Superman's origin with Krypton blowing up, with Jor-El and Lara-El putting baby Kal el into a rocket, with Starro stowing along to survive the explosion. Then we get a montage of Superman's life recapped visually from when the Kents found him, raised him, he became Superman, Batman has a cameo, how he met and married Lois, and BOOM! There is John. we are now in the present day, where the Hamilton County and Smallville have been melded together for the Superman family to live over there. Most of the movie's opening here is then mostly dedicated to introducing John to the audience as contrast to Damian Wayne, he is the less known character. At this point he has no idea of his alien heritage, or that his father is Superman, so seeing John have a good relationship with Clark in spending time with him is nice to see, and we can understand why John ends up getting disappointed when Clark has to excuse himself to go do Superman stuff. One of which happens between John's establishment scenes, in having the Justice League Watchtower fall from the orbit while Green Arrow is on monitor duty. This is where Starro is reintroduced into the movie after the time skip from the prologue by being revealed to be what caused the Justice League Watchtower to get pushed off the orbit, and Green Arrow ends up as the first one to be infected slash possessed. Then the movie has John get disappointed by his father not being present for a baseball game on his birthday, where he is unable to hit the ball. This then causes John to throw an emotional tantrum when Clark tries to apologize for his absence, during which John's powers as a human Kryptonian hybrid activate for the first time, without any animals getting hurt. This is how Clark then sees that it is the right time for him to reveal to John that he is the son of Superman, and have a proper father-son bonding time now that it is no longer kept as a secret from John. During them flying here, Jon is given this strange line, however, about the Superboy name being taken, which opens a can of worms on if Connor Kent Superboy exists in the continuity of this movie. Oh, what should I be called though? 
What about what about uh, well, Superboy's taken, right? So what about uh, Superboy's uh, taken? So Connor is Connor is a thief. Then Batman is introduced when they arrive to Gotham to have the Bat computer at the Bat Cave do some tests on John's physiology as a human Kryptonian hybrid. And that is how Damian Wayne's Robin, aka the other Super Son, is introduced. And Damian's character background is barely explored in this movie, so the filmmakers probably expected people watching this movie to know their basics on him, as Damian Wayne has existed for 16 years by the time this movie came out. There are still some Easter eggs that make Damian's character timeline in this movie very questionable. For example, the movie establishes that he is connected with the Teen Titans, whom he was leading when he first met Jon in the comics, but in this movie he does not have the same authority over them, and they are kicking him out because they don't like him. Then there is the presence of the Bat Cow, which ends up reminding me of her debut in the New 52 Batman Incorporated comics what happened in that series, and how her being here implies that Damien has been killed and resurrected by now. The boys get their first impressions, and like Peter Thomas's run in 2017, they have a rough start in starting to become friends. If his first power set was brought on by extreme stress, it stands to reason that another <sighs> traumatic moment might <sighs> unlock something else. Let's test that theory. <laughs> Damien! I'm just going to skip past how Superman and John go back to the Kent farm, then Superman and Batman go to investigate the communicators blackout on the Watchtower, where they get taken over by Starro, and then the next day happens. While John goes to school, where he is confronted by this walking stereotype of a bully and taken to the school counselor, Starro infected Batman tries and fails to have Robin be infected with Starro too. <laughs> Try to sneak up on me? Mother taught me how to avoid that in the crib. And while this fight is happening, I can't help but wonder where Nightwing, Red Hood, Batgirl, Oracle, Red Robin, aka Tim Drake, or Spoiler, aka Stephanie Brown, are while all of this is happening. Once Damien managed to fake his death to his infected father, he spies how many heroes Batman and Superman report back and forth on having been body snatched, and wow! So many heroes are missing here, like, where the hell is Wonder Woman? Cassandra Sandsmark's Wonder Girl has been established to exist, so what is the excuse for Diana's absence? From those records visible on the Bat computer, Damien then sees that Yon has not been turned and takes the Bat plane to go collect him before that happens. While he does that over the course of doing a cool thing with the walking stereotype, you No, know he's annoying, but we have no time to interact with you. Oh, you'll make time. A Starro-possessed Lois appears and has to be fought off as she tries to break through the Batplane. This is also plot relevant when it comes to eventually defeating Starro, because Damian makes Jon use his heat vision to burn the Starro spore of Lois's face, but then dropping her into the water, which caused me to initially think that it takes fire AND water to get Starros off from the possessed victims. Here the narrative divides to Lois being released from Starro's control to walk in the invasion of the Body Snatchers, while Jon and Damian go to the Fortress of Solitude to consult the artificial intelligence of Yor-El with a piece of Starro that Damian was able to cut off and store inside an evidence container. Lois does a detour at the Daily Planet, where Ron Troop is cosplaying as Jimmy Olsen and gives her the idea to ask the President of the United States to do a public address to warn everyone about Starro. At this point where the president is revealed to be Lex Luthor, I would like to say this in reference to my Superman Batman public enemies video. President Lex Luthor was a better concept when he was not based on this person. I have more to say about President Lex Luthor, but before that, I need to go over how Jon and Damien have gotten the AI jor els research notes on Starro from when he was his research subject on Krypton, and then they are sent to stop it on the Watchtower. They don't know how to do that, but eventually they do. The boys fly up to the Watchtower on Superman's old rocket that brought him to Earth, and when they get there, they are confronted by the Starro-possessed Justice League and the Teen Titans, neither of which do not include Wonder Woman, any of the Green Lanterns, the Flash, 
Aquaman or Starfire Raven, and I am not sure if this kid flash is supposed to be Wally West or Bart Allen. Anyway, Damien and Jon fight with the needed restraint against their allies and senior mentors. Jon's invulnerability activates when saving Damien from a possessed green arrow, and during all this, President Luthor's address in warning the people of Starro is broadcast. This is where President Luthor is revealed to be Starro possessed, which brings up an interesting point, because earlier we saw Starro possessed Batman and Starro possessed Lois, who were not portrayed very well in character in trying to hide how they were possessed. Batman was unresponsive before turning hostile, Lois at least put up some kind of front in trying to get close to Jon, but President Luthor was able to hide the fact that he was possessed so well that this revelation is actually done somewhat well. I'm an investigative reporter, asshole. I knew you were taking over the minute you took the meeting. No, you didn't. Don't bother trying to make yourself look better than you already are, Lois. That only makes you look worse. Just ask Jared from the Comics League, who already doesn't like you. I think that Lois Lane adds zero things to Superman. Because ultimately, she's just there to be the damsel in distress. And you could say they've tried to take her out of that, but they failed repeatedly. Like that, that Greg Rucka series by by Greg Rucka, on Lois Lane, failed miserably. And here's here's the thing, though, because fans want her to be the one that Superman saves. Anyway, after being an action mom, Lois outs her son to the entire world as someone who can stop this invasion from happening. Good thing that most of the people seeing this have already been possessed, and likely won't even remember seeing it. Jon and Damien see Lois' message to Jon telling that Starmie as a water psychic type Pokemon is weak to fire damage. It's not. That information helps them take out the possessed Justice League, Teen Titans, and eventually also their fathers, whom they then send off the Watchtower. Because as the main characters of this movie, and the only ones still capable of doing anything, they decide to go make the Watchtower fall off the orbit again, so we can take out Starro along with it as they make that happen. The boys have a moment acknowledging that this is what selfless heroism is, in sacrificing their own well-being for the sake of others, and I applaud Jeremy Adams for writing it like that. Damien seems strangely calm about all this, which further supports the idea that Damien has died and come back to life before. Anyway, the boys do what I just said they would do, and then get rescued from being burned to the death by Superman taking the part of the watchtower they were on, and slowly lands it into a lake to cool down. The no longer lost boys are embraced by their fathers, and then Starro makes one more appearance because, like I already said, fire damage is not very effective against water-type Pokémon. So instead they use a grass-type move, aka Woodhammer, which also helps Jon by being a baseball allegory to that game he was in earlier in the movie. That sends Starro flying back into the space with critical damage, and the earlier given burn damage then finishes the job. The movie then ends by showing Bruce and Damien join Clark and Lois in watching Jon in another baseball game, where he manages to hit the ball this time and win the game. And before the credits roll, Jon and Damien are shown deciding to call their team up what it is in the title, and Damien makes a brick joke from their first meeting about Jon being able to fly yet. <laughs> Still can't fly. This was a good introduction to the concept of the Super Sons and the character of Jonathan Samuel Kent Superboy, which makes it a shame that the WB didn't market it as much as they did with League of Super Pets. Because introducing Jon to a larger audience than just the fans of the character would have raised his profile more. But I think because Jon has been turned into Robin Williams in the original Jumanji movie by Brian Michael Bendis, and so is unrecognizable compared to how he was in this movie. And the fact that Tom Taylor then put Jon into a toxic relationship with his self-insert slash OC character, Jon currently exists as a night and day difference to how he is in this movie. But enough about that, that is a topic for a separate video. As a mostly CGI movie, this was quite polished and cleanly animated movie, but there is a distracting detail when all the characters are 3D models without different variants. Some characters do, like Superman and Clark Kent, have different models, 
Bruce Wayne and Batman have different models, Damian and Robin have different models, and Jon has three models in his civilian clothes, his baseball outfit and his Superboy costume. But let's take Lois Lane as another example. She goes through this entire movie wearing the exact same clothes, and especially after she fell to that pond of water, Lois doesn't even go get a change of clothes and instead goes to the Daily Planet in the same wet clothes in the next scene. Moving on to the cast, the titular characters were voiced by Jack Dylan Grazer and Jack Griffith, who gave good performance to Don and Damien, especially to the latter one after his previous performances. Both were able to represent their characters to introduce them to what should have been a larger audience than this. Then in the roles of their parents, Superman and Lois were voiced by a husband and wife team of Travis Willingham and Laura Bailey, which fit them both rather well, while their friend Troy Baker was used minimally as Batman, while Talia Al Ghul was not a part of this film. The AI jor -El was voiced by Nolan North as a previous Superman actor from Young Justice and wow this movie had a small cast of actors and characters. However, something I don't much pay attention to and probably wouldn't have if I didn't originally try to do a reaction video to this movie was that the end credits end up disrespecting people without whom this movie would not exist. And that is when crediting the people who created these characters. As Batman and Superman are in the movie's title, their creators, aka Jerry Siegel and George Schuster, along with Bobby Kane and Bill Finger are credited, as well as Carter Fox and Mike Sekovsky, who created Starro. But for the creation of John and Damien, as well as their team-up, the end credits do not mention Bob Haney, Dick Dillon, Dan Jurgens, Lee Weeks, Grant Morrison, and Andy Kubert or even Peter Tomasi. Like I said, without those people, these versions of the Super Sons would not exist, and the least DC Entertainment and Warner Bros. Animation could have done would have been to put their names to the end credits. Not having them on there is either denying their contributions or being too lazy to write them down there. Also, there is the way how the end credits go down from a starry night sky in space to the sunny Kent farm on the surface of Earth, as if to set up a post-credit scene that ultimately never comes. Still, this was a serviceably good movie that has the feeling of setting up more to come, and the writer Jeremy Adams has expressed interest to explore these versions of Super Sons in the future. Naturally, that is above his pay grade, but otherwise, when looking at his work in writing the current Flash comics, I could see Jeremy Adams as smart enough to tell the Super Sun story forward, without rushing in to make them too old like Bendis did. Because doing that, and what Tom Taylor did in following them, would be like driving your car off the cliff after seeing someone else do it first. In this case, I'm looking at you, Season 3 of Superman and Lois. Don't you dare drive off that cliff after recasting Jordan Els as with Michael Bishop as John. And that is probably the point where I should stop this review. The next video I will be working on is the comic to adaptation comparison review on Superman Red Sun, while I'm also streaming Near Replicant version 1.2. 2474487139. Feel free to like this video if my review on the movie was entertaining to watch and comment about it down below. Share the video for more people to see and subscribe to my channel for the following videos. Digging the bell is also an option because that alerts you when I do gameplay streams where you can chat with me and get your name onto the videos I will do on those stream games. May your heart be your guiding key.